Uh, my question pertains to your argument about racism and the Democratic Party historically. Could you provide context within the last 10 years for racist policies enacted by Democrats if it's true that their historical behavior influences what they do now? And I'd appreciate if you could speak specifically to repealing provisions of the Voting Rights Act in red states like North Carolina. <laughs> the question is about um, um, racism today and these arguments about voter ID laws in North Carolina. It is true, historically, that a lot of voting rules, from literacy tests to poll taxes, uh, to even, you may say, uh, extreme demands uh, that you produce various types of credentialing, were used by Democrats to prevent blacks from voting. And this was done for 75 years. The same people who did that now pretend to be inflamed about much less onerous, simple ID laws that basically say nothing more than something like produce a driver's license if you're going to vote. Now, I don't deny the historical echo, but the historical echo loses its validity when the voter ID laws are not being pressed by the same people. The question, the deeper part of the question is, so prove to me that the Democratic Party is racist now. And um, as often happens with a tough question, this is kind of when I rise to the occasion. Um, um, well, let me just say this. If one goes today to the Democratic-controlled inner city, and we're talking here about some two dozen cities entirely dominated by the Democratic Party, there's not a Republican in sight. I argue that we will see in them now all the five features of the slave plantation that Kenneth Stamp outlined in his classic work, The Peculiar Institution. In a description of the plantation, Kenneth Stamp identifies five things that you would see on a slave plantation. Number one, broken down, dilapidated, and unsafe housing. Number two, broken families. You can see this under slavery. There was a confusion of who's the real father. Mulattoes running around in the plantation, the family structure and decay. Number three, a high degree of violence required to hold the place together. Police power, whippings, overseers, fences, barbed wire. <clears throat> Number four, everybody gets a basic provision. You need food, you have health care, they call the doctor. But nobody gets ahead. There's no opportunity. Nobody really advances. The Southerners and the Democrats used to call slavery a school of civilization. And Stamp goes, that's not a school from which anyone ever seemed to graduate. And finally, nihilism and despair, a feeling that there's no future, that this is an intergenerational, ongoing, lasting way of life. Now, all those five features can be traced directly to inner city Oakland, inner city Baltimore, many places, Chicago. And like I say, this has been going on since the 60s. The United States has spent trillions of dollars to fix these places. The Democrats have been in charge of fixing it. And yet, many of these places are no better off than they were in 1967. Think about that. <laughs> so, at the very least, this reflects a callous and shocking disdain for the welfare of the people who live in those communities. And for me, this is a big opportunity for Trump. If Trump is able to talk straight to people in our inner cities, and I would add in our barrios and on our native reservations, and show them that there's a way to get up and get off the plantation, this would be a mammoth opportunity for the Republican Party.